The human eye is a sensory organ, part of the sensory nervous system, that reacts to visible light and allows humans to use visual information for various purposes including seeing things, keeping balance, and maintaining circadian rhythm. The eye can be considered as a living optical device. It is approximately spherical in shape, with its outer layers, such as the outermost, white part of the eye, the sclera, and one of its inner layers, the pigmented choroid, keeping the eye essentially light tight except on the eye's optic axis. In order, along the optic axis, the optical components consist of a first lens, the cornea the clear part of the eye, that accounts for most of the optical power of the eye and accomplishes most of the focusing of light from the outside world, then an aperture, the pupil, in a diaphragm, the iris the colored part of the eye, that controls the amount of light entering the interior of the eye, then another lens, the crystalline lens, that accomplishes the remaining focusing of light into images, and finally a light-sensitive part of the eye, the retina, where the images fall and are processed. The retina makes a connection to the brain via the optic nerve. The remaining components of the eye keep it in its required shape, nourish and maintain it, and protect it. Three types of cells in the retina convert light energy into electrical energy used by the nervous system. Rods respond to low-intensity light and contribute to perception of low-resolution, black and white images. Cones respond to high-intensity light and contribute to perception of high-resolution, colored images, and the recently discovered photosensitive ganglion cells respond to a full range of light intensities and contribute to adjusting the amount of light reaching the retina, to regulating and suppressing the hormone melatonin and to entraining circadian rhythm. Humans have two eyes, situated on the left and the right of the face. The eyes sit in bony cavities called the orbits, in the skull. There are six extra ocular muscles that control eye movements. The front visible part of the eye is made up of the whitish sclera, a colored iris, and the pupil. A thin layer called the conjunctiva sits on top of this. The front part is also called the anterior segment of the eye. The eye is not shaped like a perfect sphere. Rather it is a fused two-piece unit, composed of an anterior, front, segment and the posterior, back, segment. The anterior segment is made up of the cornea, iris and lens. The cornea is transparent and more curved and is linked to the larger posterior segment, composed of the vitreous, retina, choroid and the outer white shell called the sclera. The cornea is typically about 11.5 mm, 0.45 in, in diameter and 0.5 mm, 500 mm, in thickness near its center. The posterior chamber constitutes the remaining 5 sixths, its diameter is typically about 24 mm, 0.94 in. An area termed the limbus connects the cornea and sclera. The iris is the pigmented circular structure concentrically surrounding the center of the eye, the pupil, which appears to be black. The size of the pupil, which controls the amount of light entering. The eye, is adjusted by the iris dilator and sphincter muscles. Light energy enters the eye through the cornea, through the pupil and then through the lens. The lens shape is changed for near focus, accommodation, and is controlled by the ciliary muscle. Between the two lenses, there are four optical surfaces which each refract light as it travels along the optical path. One basic model. Describing the geometry of the optical system is the Arizona eye model. This model describes the accommodation of the eye geometrically. Photons of light falling on the light-sensitive cells of the retina, photoreceptor cones and rods, are converted into electrical signals that are transmitted to the brain by the optic nerve and interpreted as sight and vision. The size of the eye differs among adults by only 1 or 2 millimeters. The eyeball is generally less tall than it is wide. The sagittal vertical height of a human adult eye is approximately 23.7 millimeters. 0.93 in, the transverse horizontal diameter, width, is 24.2 mm, 0.95 in, and the axial anteroposterior size, depth, averages 22.0 to 24.8 mm, 0.87 to 0.98 in, with no significant difference between sexes and age groups. Strong correlation has been found between the transverse diameter and the width of the orbit, R0.88. The typical adult eye has an anterior to posterior diameter of 24 mm, 0.94 in, and a volume of 6 cubic centimeters, 0.37 cu in. The eyeball grows rapidly, increasing from about 16 to 17 mm, 0.63 to 0.67 in, 
diameter at birth to 22.5 to 23 mm, 0.89 to 0.91 in, by 3 years of age. By age 12, the eye attains its full size. The eye is made up of three coats, or layers, enclosing various anatomical structures. The outermost layer, known as the fibrous tunic, is composed of the cornea and sclera, which provide shape to the eye and support the deeper structures. The middle layer, known as the vascular tunic or uvea, consists of the choroid, ciliary body, pigmented epithelium, and iris. The innermost is the retina, which gets its oxygenation from the blood vessels of the choroid, posteriorly, as well as the retinal vessels, anteriorly. The spaces of the eye are filled with the aqueous humor anteriorly, between the cornea and lens, and the vitreous body, a jelly-like substance, behind the lens, filling the entire posterior cavity. The aqueous humor is a clear watery fluid that is contained in two areas, the anterior chamber between the cornea and the iris, and the posterior chamber between the iris and the lens. The lens is suspended to the ciliary body by the suspensory ligament, zonal of zin, made up of hundreds of fine transparent fibers which transmit muscular forces to change the shape of the lens for accommodation, focusing. The vitreous body is a clear substance composed of water and proteins, which give it a jelly-like and sticky composition. Each eye has seven extraocular muscles located in its orbit. Six of these muscles control the eye movements, the seventh controls the movement of the upper eyelid. The six muscles are four recti muscles, the lateral rectus, the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, and the superior rectus, and two oblique muscles the inferior oblique, and the superior oblique. The seventh muscle is the levator palpebri superioris muscle. When the muscles exert different tensions, a torque is exerted on the globe that causes it to turn, in almost pure rotation, with only about 1 mm of translation. Thus, the eye can be considered as undergoing rotations about a single point in the center of the eye. The approximate field of view of an individual human eye, measured from the fixation point, i.e., the point at which one's gaze is directed, varies by facial anatomy, but is typically 30 superior, up, limited by the brow, 45 nasal, limited by the nose, 70 inferior, down, and 100 temporal, towards the temple. For both eyes, combined, binocular vision, visual field is approximately 100 vertical and a maximum 190 horizontal. Approximately 120 of which makes up the binocular field of view, seen by both eyes, flanked by two uniocular fields, seen by only one eye, of approximately 40 degrees. It is an area of 4.17 steratians Oregon, 13700 square degrees for binocular vision. When viewed at large angles from the side, the iris and pupil may still be visible by the viewer, indicating the person has peripheral vision possible at that angle. About 15 temporal and 1.5 below the horizontal is the blind spot created by the optic nerve nasally, which is roughly 7.5 high and 5.5 wide. The retina has a static contrast ratio of around 100 colon 1, about 6.5 f-stops. As soon as the eye moves rapidly to acquire a target, SACC aids, it readjusts its exposure by adjusting the iris, which adjusts the size of the pupil. Initial dark. Adaptation takes place in approximately 4 seconds of profound, uninterrupted darkness, full adaptation through adjustments in retinal rod photoreceptors is 80% complete in 30 minutes. The process is non-linear and multifaceted, so an interruption by light exposure requires restarting the dark adaptation process over again. The human eye can detect a luminance from 106 cd m2, or 1 millionth, 0.000001, of a candela per square meter to 108 cd m2 or 100 million, 100 million, candelas per square meter. That is it has a range of 1014 cd m2 or 100 trillion 100 trillion, about 46.5 f-stops. This range does not include looking at the midday sun, 109 cd slash m2, or lightning discharge. At the low end of the range is the absolute threshold of vision for a steady light. Across a wide field of view, about 106 cd slash m2, 0.000001 candela per square meter. The upper end of the range is given in terms of normal visual performance as 108 cd m2, 100 million or 100 million candelas per square meter. 
The eye includes a lens similar to lenses found in optical instruments such as cameras and the same physics principles can be applied. The pupil of the human eye is its aperture. The iris is the diaphragm that serves as the aperture stop. Refraction in the cornea causes the effective aperture, the entrance pupil, to differ slightly from the physical pupil diameter. The entrance pupil is typically about 4 mm in diameter, although it can range from 2 mm f 8.3, in a brightly lit place to 8 mm f 2.1, in the dark. The latter value decreases slowly with age. Older people's eyes sometimes dilate to not more than 5 to 6 mm in the dark, and may be as small as 1 mm in the light. The visual system in the human brain is too slow to process information if images are slipping across the retina at more than a few degrees per second. Thus, to be able to see while moving, the brain must compensate for the motion of the head by turning the eyes. Frontal eyed animals have a small area of the retina with very high visual acuity, the fovea centralis. It covers about 2 degrees of visual angle in people. To get a clear view of the world, the brain must turn the eyes so that the image of the object of regard falls on the fovea. Any failure to make eye movements correctly can lead to serious visual degradation. Having two eyes allows the brain to determine the depth and distance of an object, called stereovision, and gives the sense of three-dimensionality to the vision. Both eyes must point accurately enough that the object of regard falls on corresponding points of the two retinas to stimulate stereovision, otherwise, double vision might occur. Some persons with congenitally crossed eyes tend to ignore one eye's vision, thus do not suffer double vision, and do not have stereovision. The movements of the eye are controlled by six muscles attached to each eye, and allow the eye to elevate, depress, converge, diverge, and roll. These muscles are both controlled voluntarily and involuntarily to track objects and correct for simultaneous head movements. Rapid eye movement, REM, typically refers to the sleep stage during which the most vivid dreams occur. During this stage, the eyes move rapidly. SACC aids are quick, simultaneous movements of both eyes in the same direction controlled by the frontal lobe of the brain. Even when looking intently at a single spot, the eyes drift around. This ensures that individual photosensitive cells are continually stimulated in different degrees. Without changing input, these cells would otherwise stop generating output. Eye movements include drift, ocular tremor, and microsaccades. Some irregular drifts, movements smaller than a saccade and larger than a microsaccad, subtend up to one-tenth of a degree. Researchers vary in their definition of microsaccades by amplitude. Martin Rolfe states that the majority of microsaccades observed in a variety of tasks have amplitudes smaller than 30 minarch. However, others state that the current consensus has largely consolidated around a definition of microsaccades that includes magnitudes up to one. The vestibulo-ocular reflex is a reflex eye movement that stabilizes images on the retina during head movement by producing an eye movement in the direction opposite to head movement in response to neural input from the vestibular system of the inner ear, thus maintaining the image in the center of the visual field. For example, when the head moves to the right, the eyes move to the left. This applies for head movements up and down, left and right, and tilt to the right and left, all of which give input to the ocular muscles to maintain visual stability. Eyes can also follow a moving object around. This tracking is less accurate than the vestibulo-ocular reflex, as it requires the brain to process incoming visual information and supply feedback. Following an object moving at constant speed is relatively easy, though the eyes will often make SACC aids to keep up. The smooth pursuit movement can move the eye at up to 100-s in adult humans. It is more difficult to visually estimate speed in low-light conditions or while moving, unless there is another point of reference for determining speed. The optokinetic reflex, or optokinetic nystagmus, stabilizes the image on the retina through visual feedback. It is induced when the entire visual scene drifts across the retina, eliciting eye rotation in the same direction and at a velocity that minimizes the motion of the image on the retina. When the gaze direction deviates too far from the forward heading, a compensatory saccade is induced to reset the gaze to the center of the visual field. For example, when looking out of the window at a moving train, the eyes can focus on a moving train for a short moment, by stabilizing it on the retina, until the train moves out of the field of vision. At this point, the eye is moved back to the point where it first saw the train, through a saccade. 
The adjustment to close range vision involves three processes to focus an image on the retina. When a creature with binocular vision looks at an object, the eyes must rotate around a vertical axis so that the projection of the image is in the center of the retina in both eyes. To look at a nearby object, the eyes rotate towards each other, convergence, while for an object farther away they rotate away from each other, divergence. Lenses cannot refract light rays at their edges as well as closer to the center. The image produced by any lens is therefore somewhat blurry around the edges, spherical aberration. It can be minimized by screening out peripheral light rays and looking only at the better focused center. In the eye, the pupil serves this purpose by constricting while the eye is focused on nearby objects. Small apertures also give an increase in depth of field, allowing a broader range of in-focus vision. In this way the pupil has a dual purpose for near vision, to reduce spherical aberration and increase depth of field. Changing the curvature of the lens is carried out by the ciliary muscles surrounding the lens, this process is known as accommodation. Accommodation narrows the inner diameter of the ciliary body, which actually relaxes the fibers of the suspensory ligament attached to the periphery of the lens, and also allows the lens to relax into a more convex, or globular, shape. A more convex lens refracts light more strongly and focuses divergent light rays from near objects onto the retina, allowing closer objects to be brought into better focus. The human eye contains enough complexity to warrant specialized attention and care beyond the duties of a general practitioner. These specialists, or eye care professionals, serve different functions in different countries. Eye care professionals can have overlap in their patient care privileges. For example, both an ophthalmologist, MD, and optometrist, OD, are professionals who diagnose eye disease and can prescribe lenses to correct vision. Typically, only ophthalmologists are licensed to perform surgical procedures. Ophthalmologists may also specialize within a surgical area, such as cornea, cataracts, laser, retina, or oculoplastics. Eye care professionals include ocularists, ophthalmologists, optometrists, opticians, orthoptists, and vision. Therapists' eye irritation has been defined as the magnitude of any stinging, scratching, burning, or other irritating sensation from the eye. It is a common problem experienced by people of all ages. Related eye symptoms and signs of irritation are discomfort, dryness, excess tearing, itchiness, grating, foreign body sensation, ocular fatigue, pain, soreness, redness, swollen eyelids, and tiredness, etc. These eye symptoms are reported with intensities from mild to severe. It has been suggested that these eye symptoms are related to different causal mechanisms, and symptoms are related to the particular ocular anatomy involved. Several suspected causal factors in our environment have been studied so far. One hypothesis is that indoor air pollution may cause eye and airway. Irritation. Eye irritation depends somewhat on destabilization of the outer eye tear film, i.e. the formation of dry spots on the cornea, resulting in ocular discomfort. Occupational factors are also likely to influence the perception of eye irritation. Some of these are lighting, glare and poor contrast, gaze position, reduced blink rate, limited number of breaks from visual tasking, and a constant combination of accommodation, musculoskeletal burden, and impairment of the visual nervous system. Another factor that may be related is work stress. In addition, psychological factors have been found in multivariate analyzes to be associated with an increase in eye irritation among VDU users. Other risk factors, such as chemical toxins slash irritants, e.g. amines, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, acrolein, endicane, vox, ozone, pesticides and preservatives, allergens, etc., might cause eye irritation as well. Certain volatile organic compounds that are both chemically reactive and airway irritants may cause eye irritation. Personal factors, e.g. use of contact lenses, eye makeup, and certain medications, may also affect destabilization of the tear film and possibly result in more eye symptoms. Nevertheless, if airborne particles alone should destabilize the tear film and cause eye irritation, their content of surface active compounds must be high. An integrated physiological risk model with blink frequency, destabilization, and breakup of the eye tear film as inseparable phenomena may explain eye irritation among office workers in terms of occupational, climate, and eye-related physiological risk factors. There are two major measures of eye irritation. One is blink frequency which can be observed by human behavior. 
The other measures are breakup time, tear flow, hyperemia, redness, swelling, tear fluid cytology, and epithelial damage, vital stains, etc., which are human beings' physiological reactions. Blink frequency is defined as the number of blinks per minute and it is associated with eye irritation. Blink frequencies are individual with mean frequencies of 2 to 3 to 20 to 30 blinks slash minute, and they depend on environmental factors including the use of contact lenses. Dehydration, mental activities, work conditions, room temperature, relative humidity, and illumination all influence blink frequency. Breakup time, but, is another major measure of eye irritation and tear film stability. It is defined as the time interval, in seconds, between blinking and rupture, but is considered to reflect the stability of the tear film as well. In normal persons, the breakup time exceeds the interval between blinks, and, therefore, the tear film is maintained. Studies have shown that blink frequency is correlated negatively with breakup time. This phenomenon indicates that perceived eye irritation is associated with an increase in blink frequency since the cornea and conjunctiva both have sensitive nerve endings that belong to the first trigeminal branch. Other evaluating methods, such as hyperemia, cytology etc. have increasingly been used to assess eye irritation. There are other factors that are related to eye irritation as well. Three major factors that influence the most are indoor air pollution, contact lenses, and gender differences. Field studies have found that the prevalence of objective eye signs is often significantly altered among office workers in comparisons with random samples of the general population. These research results might indicate that indoor air pollution has played an important role in causing eye irritation. There are more and more people wearing contact lens now and dry eyes appear to be the most common complaint among contact lens wearers. Although both contact lens wearers and spectacle wearers experience similar eye irritation symptoms, dryness, redness, and grittiness have been reported far more frequently among contact lens wearers and with greater severity than among spectacle wearers. Studies have shown that incidence of dry eyes increases with age, especially among women. Tear film stability, e.g. tear breakup time, is significantly lower among women than among men. In addition, women have a higher blink frequency while reading. Several factors may contribute to gender differences. One is the use of eye makeup. Another reason could be that the women in the reported studies have done more VDU work than the men, including lower grade work. A third often quoted explanation is related to the age-dependent decrease of tear secretion, particularly among women after 40 years of age. In a study conducted by UCLA, the frequency of reported symptoms in industrial buildings was investigated. The study's results were that eye irritation was the most frequent symptom in industrial building spaces, at 81%. Modern office work with use of office equipment has raised concerns about possible adverse health effects. Since the 1970s, reports have linked mucosal, skin, and general symptoms to work with self-copying paper. Emission of various particulate and volatile substances has been suggested as specific causes. These symptoms have been related to sick building. Syndrome, SBS, which involves symptoms such as irritation to the eyes, skin, and upper airways, headache and fatigue. Many of the symptoms described in SBS and multiple chemical sensitivity, MCS, resemble the symptoms known to be elicited by airborne irritant chemicals. A repeated measurement design was employed in the study of acute symptoms of eye and respiratory tract irritation resulting from occupational exposure to sodium borate dusts. The symptom assessment of the 79 exposed and 27 unexposed subjects comprised interviews before the shift began and then at regular hourly intervals for the next six hours of the shift, four days in a row. Exposures were monitored concurrently with a personal real-time aerosol monitor. Two different exposure profiles, a daily average and short-term, 15-minute, average, were used in the analysis. Exposure response relations were evaluated by linking incidence rates for each symptom with categories of exposure, acute incidence rates for nasal, eye, and throat irritation, and coughing and breathlessness were found to be associated with increased exposure levels of both exposure indices. Steeper exposure response slopes were seen when short-term exposure concentrations were used. Results from multivariate logistic regression analysis suggest that current smokers tended to be less sensitive to the exposure to airborne sodium borate dust. Several actions can be taken to prevent eye irritation. 
trying to maintain normal blinking by avoiding room temperatures that are too high, avoiding relative humidities that are too high or too low, because they reduce blink frequency or may increase water evaporation, trying to maintain an intact film of tears by the following actions, blinking and short breaks may be beneficial for VDU users. Increasing these two actions might help maintain the tear film. Downward gazing is recommended to reduce ocular surface area and water evaporation. The distance between the VDU and keyboard should be kept as short as possible to minimize evaporation from the ocular surface area by a low direction of the gaze, and blink training can be beneficial. In addition, other measures are proper lid hygiene, avoidance of eye rubbing, and proper use of personal products and medication. Eye makeup should be used with care. There are many diseases, disorders, and age-related changes that may affect the eyes and surrounding structures. As the eye ages, certain changes occur that can be attributed solely to the aging process. Most of these anatomic and physiologic processes follow a gradual decline. With aging, the quality of vision worsens due to reasons independent of diseases of the aging eye. While there are many changes of significance in the non-diseased eye, the most functionally important changes seem to be a reduction in pupil size and the loss of accommodation or focusing capability, presbyopia. The area of the pupil governs the amount of light that can reach the retina. The extent to which the pupil dilates decreases with age, leading to a substantial decrease in light received at the retina. In comparison to younger people, it is as though older persons are constantly wearing medium-density sunglasses. Therefore, for any detailed visually guided tasks on which performance varies with illumination, older persons require extra lighting. Certain ocular diseases can come from sexually transmitted infections such as herpes and genital warts. If contact between the eye and area of infection occurs, the STI can be transmitted to the eye. With aging, a prominent white ring develops in the periphery of the cornea called arcus senilis. Aging causes laxity, downward shift of eyelid tissues and atrophy of the orbital fat. These changes contribute to the etiology of several eyelid disorders such as ectropion, entropion, dermatocolasis, and ptosis. The vitreous gel undergoes liquefaction, posterior vitreous detachment or PVD, and its opacities visible as floaters. Gradually increase in number. Eye care professionals, including ophthalmologists and optometrists, are involved in the treatment and management of ocular and vision disorders. A Snellen chart is one type of eye chart used to measure visual acuity. At the conclusion of a complete eye examination, the eye doctor might provide the patient with an eyeglass prescription for corrective lenses. Some disorders of the eyes for which corrective lenses are prescribed include myopia, nearsightedness, hyperopia, farsightedness, astigmatism, and presbyopia, the loss of focusing range during aging. Macular degeneration is especially prevalent in the U.S. and affects roughly 1.75 million Americans each year. Having lower levels of lutein and zeaxanthin within the macula may be associated with an increase in the risk of age-related macular degeneration. Lutein and zeaxanthin act as antioxidants that protect the retina and macula from oxidative damage from high-energy light waves. As the light waves enter the eye, they excite electrons that can cause harm to the cells in the eye, but they can cause oxidative damage that may lead to macular degeneration or cataracts. Lutein and zeaxanthin bind to the electron-free radical and are reduced rendering the electron safe. There are many ways to ensure a diet rich in lutein and zeaxanthin, the best of which is to eat dark green vegetables including kale, spinach, broccoli, and turnip greens. Nutrition is an important aspect of the ability to achieve and maintain proper eye health. Lutein and zeaxanthin are two major carotenoids, found in the macula of the eye, that are being researched to identify their role in the pathogenesis of eye disorders such as age-related macular degeneration and cataracts. Human eyes, particularly the iris and its color, and the area surrounding the eye, lids, lashes, brows, have long been a key component of physical attractiveness. Eye contact plays a significant role in human nonverbal communication. A prominent limbal ring, dark ring around the iris of the eye, is considered attractive. Additionally, long and full eyelashes are coveted as a sign of beauty and are considered an attractive facial feature. Pupil size has also been shown to play an influential role in attraction and nonverbal communication, with dilated, larger, pupils perceived to be more attractive. It should also be noted that Dilated pupils are a response to sexual arousal and stimuli. In the Renaissance, 
women used the juice of the berries of the belladonna plant in eye drops to dilate the pupils and make the eyes appear more seductive. Eyes are organs of the visual system. They provide living organisms with vision, the ability to receive and process visual detail, as well as enabling several photo response functions that are independent of vision. Eyes detect light and convert it into electrochemical impulses in neurons, neurons. In higher organisms, the eye is a complex optical system which collects light from the surrounding environment, regulates its intensity through a diaphragm, focuses it through an adjustable assembly of lenses to form an image, converts this image into a set of electrical signals, and transmits these signals to the brain through complex neural pathways that connect the eye via the optic nerve to the visual cortex and other areas of the brain. Eyes with resolving power have come in 10 fundamentally different forms, and 96% of animal species possess a complex optical system. Image-resolving eyes are present in mollusks, chordates, and arthropods. The most simple eyes, pit eyes, are eye spots which may be set into a pit to reduce the angle of light that enters and affects the eye spot, to allow the organism to deduce the angle of incoming light. From more complex eyes, retinal photosensitive ganglion cells send signals along the retinohypothalamic tract to the suprachiasmatic nuclei to affect circadian adjustment and to the pretectal area. To control the pupillary light reflex, complex eyes distinguish shapes and colors. The visual fields of many organisms, especially predators, involve large areas of binocular vision for depth perception. In other organisms, particularly prey animals, eyes are located to maximize the field of view, such as in rabbits and horses, which have monocular vision. The first proto-eyes evolved among animals 600 million years ago about the time of the Cambrian explosion. The last common ancestor of animals possessed the biochemical toolkit necessary for vision, and more advanced eyes have evolved in 96% of animal species in 6 of the 35 main phyla. In most vertebrates and some mollusks, the eye allows light to enter and project onto a light-sensitive layer of cells known as the retina. The cone cells, for color, and the rod cells, for low-light contrasts, in the retina detect and convert light into neural signals which are transmitted to the brain via the optic nerve to produce vision. Such eyes are typically spheroid, filled with the transparent gel-like vitreous humor, possess a focusing lens, and often an iris. Muscles around the iris change the size of the pupil, regulating the amount of light that enters the eye and reducing aberrations when there is enough light. The eyes of most cephalopods, fish, amphibians, and snakes have fixed lens shapes, and focusing is achieved by telescoping the lens in a similar manner to that of a camera. The compound eyes of the arthropods are composed of many simple facets which, depending on anatomical detail, may give either a single pixelated image or multiple images per eye. Each sensor has its own lens and photosensitive cells. Some eyes have up to 28,000 such sensors arranged hexagonally, which can give a full 360 field of vision. Compound eyes are very sensitive to motion. Some arthropods, including many Strepsiptera, have compound eyes of only a few facets, each with a retina capable of creating an image. With each eye producing a different image, a fused, high-resolution image is produced in the brain. The eyes of mantis shrimps, here Odontodactylus salaris, are considered the most complex in the whole animal kingdom. Possessing detailed hyperspectral color vision, the mantis shrimp has the world's most complex color vision system. Trilobites, now extinct, had unique compound eyes. Clear calcite crystals formed the lenses of their eyes. They differ in this from most other arthropods, which have soft eyes. The number of lenses in such an eye varied widely. Some trilobites had only one while others had thousands of lenses per eye. In contrast to compound eyes, simple eyes have a single lens. Jumping spiders have one pair of large simple eyes with a narrow field of view, augmented by an array of smaller eyes for peripheral vision. Some insect larvae, like caterpillars, have a type of simple eye, stemmata, which usually provides only a rough image, but, as in sawfly larvae, can possess resolving powers of 4 degrees of arcade B polarization sensitive and capable of increasing its absolute sensitivity at night by a factor of 1,000 or more. Ocelli, some of the simplest eyes, are found in animals such as some of the snails. They have photosensitive cells but no lens or other means of projecting an image onto those cells. They can distinguish between light and dark but no more, enabling them to avoid direct sunlight. In organisms dwelling near deep sea vents, 
Compound eyes are adapted to see the infrared light produced by the hot vents, allowing the creatures to avoid being boiled alive. There are 10 different eye layouts indeed every technological method of capturing an optical image commonly used by human beings, with the exceptions of zoom and Fresnel lenses, occur in nature. Eye types can be categorized into simple eyes, with one concave photoreceptive surface, and compound eyes, which comprise a number of individual lenses laid out on a convex surface. Simple. Does not imply a reduced level of complexity or acuity. Indeed, any eye type can be adapted for almost any behavior or environment. The only limitations specific to eye types are that of resolution the physics of compound eyes prevents them from achieving a resolution better than one. Also, superposition eyes can achieve greater sensitivity than apposition eyes, so are better suited to dark-dwelling creatures. Eyes also fall into two groups on the basis of their photoreceptor's cellular construction, with the photoreceptor cells either being ciliated, as in the vertebrates, or rhabdomeric. These two groups are not monophyletic, the nadaria also possess ciliated cells, and some gastropods and annelids possess both. Some organisms have photosensitive cells that do nothing but detect whether the surroundings are light or dark, which is sufficient for the entrainment of circadian rhythms. These are not considered eyes because they lack enough structure to be considered an organ, and do not produce an image. Simple eyes are rather ubiquitous, and lens-bearing eyes have evolved at least seven times in vertebrates, cephalopods, and lids, crustaceans, and cubozoa. Pit eyes, also known as stemma, are eye spots which may be set into a pit to reduce the angles of light that enters and affects the eye spot, to allow the organism to deduce the angle of incoming light. Found in about 85% of phyla, these basic forms were probably the precursors to more advanced types of simple eyes. They are small, comprising up to about 100 cells covering about 100 m. The directionality can be improved by reducing the size of the aperture, by incorporating a reflective layer behind the receptor cells, or by filling the pit with a refractal material. Pit vipers have developed pits that function as eyes by sensing thermal infrared radiation, in addition to their optical wavelength eyes like those of other vertebrates, see infrared sensing in snakes. However, pit organs are fitted with receptors rather different from photoreceptors, namely a specific transient receptor potential channel, TRP channels, called TRPV1. The main difference is that photoreceptors are G-protein coupled receptors but TRP are ion channels. The resolution of pit eyes can be greatly improved by incorporating a material with a higher refractive index to form a lens, which may greatly reduce the blur radius encountered hence increasing the resolution obtainable. The most basic form, seen in some gastropods and annelids, consists of a lens of one refractive index. A far sharper image can be obtained using materials with a high refractive index, decreasing to the edges, this decreases the focal length and thus allows a sharp image to form on the retina. This also allows a larger aperture. For a given sharpness of image, allowing more light to enter the lens, and a flatter lens, reducing spherical aberration. Such a non-homogeneous lens is necessary for the focal length to drop from about 4 times the lens radius, to 2.5 radii. Heterogeneous eyes have evolved at least 9 times, 4 or more times in gastropods, once in the copepods, once in the annelids, once in the cephalopods, and once in the chitons, which have aragonite lenses. No extant aquatic organisms possess homogeneous lenses, Presumably the evolutionary pressure for a heterogeneous lens is great enough for this stage to be quickly outgrown. This eye creates an image that is sharp enough that motion of the eye can cause significant blurring. To minimize the effect of eye motion while the animal moves, most such eyes have stabilizing eye muscles. The ocelli of insects bear a simple lens, but their focal point usually lies behind the retina, consequently, those cannot form a sharp image. Ocelli, pit-type eyes of arthropods, blur the image across the whole retina, and are consequently excellent at responding to rapid changes in light intensity across the whole visual field, this fast response is further accelerated by the large nerve bundles which rush the information to the brain. Focusing the image would also cause the sun's image to be focused on a few receptors, with the possibility of damage under the intense light, shielding the receptors would block out some light and thus reduce their sensitivity. This fast response has led to suggestions that the ocelli of insects are used mainly in flight, because they can be used to detect sudden changes in which way is up, because light, 
especially UV light which is absorbed by vegetation, usually comes from above. Some marine organisms bear more than one lens, for instance the copepod pondella has three. The outer has a parabolic surface, countering the effects of spherical aberration while allowing a sharp image to be formed. Another copepod, copilia, has two lenses in each eye, arranged like those in a telescope. Such arrangements are rare and poorly understood, but represent an alternative construction. Multiple lenses are seen in some hunters such as eagles and jumping spiders, which have a refractive cornea. These have a negative lens, enlarging the observed image by up to 50% over the receptor cells, thus increasing their optical resolution. In the eyes of most mammals, birds, reptiles, and most other terrestrial vertebrates, along with spiders and some insect larvae, the vitreous fluid has a higher refractive index than the air. In general, the lens is not spherical. Spherical lenses produce spherical aberration. In refractive corneas, the lens tissue is corrected with inhomogeneous lens material, see Lundberg, lens, or with an aspheric shape. Flattening the lens has a disadvantage, the quality of vision is diminished away from the main line of focus. Thus, animals that have evolved with a wide field of view often have eyes that make use of an inhomogeneous lens. As mentioned above, a refractive cornea is only useful out of water. In water, there is little difference in refractive index between the vitreous fluid and the surrounding water. Hence creatures that have returned to the water penguins and seals, for example lose their highly curved cornea and return to lens-based vision. An alternative solution, borne by some divers, is to have a very strongly focusing cornea. An alternative to a lens is to line the inside of the eye with mirrors, and reflect the image to focus at a central point. The nature of these eyes means that if one were to peer into the pupil of an eye, one would see the same image that the organism would see, reflected back out. Many small organisms such as rotifers, copepods, and flatworms use such organs, but these are too small to produce usable images. Some larger organisms, such as scallops, also use reflector eyes. The scallop pectin has up to 100 mm scale reflector eyes fringing the edge of its shell. It detects moving objects as they pass successive lenses. There is at least one vertebrate, the spookfish, whose eyes include reflective optics for focusing of light. Each of the two eyes of a spookfish collects light from both above and below, the light coming from above is focused by a lens, while that coming from below, by a curved mirror composed of many layers of small, reflective plates made of guanine crystals. A compound eye may consist of thousands of individual photoreceptor units or ometidia, ometidium, singular. The image perceived is a combination of inputs from the numerous ometidia, individual eye units, which are located on a convex surface, thus pointing in slightly different directions. Compared with simple eyes, compound eyes possess a very large view angle, and can detect fast movement and, in some cases, the polarization of light. Because the individual lenses are so small, the effects of diffraction impose a limit on the possible resolution that can be obtained assuming that they do not function as phased arrays. This can only be countered by increasing lens size and number. To see with a resolution comparable to our simple eyes, humans would require very large compound eyes, around 11 meters, 36 feet, in radius. Compound eyes fall into two groups, apposition eyes, which form multiple inverted images, and superposition eyes, which form a single erect image. Compound eyes are common in arthropods, and lids, and some bivalved mollusks. Compound eyes in arthropods grow at their margins by the addition of new ometidia. Apposition eyes are the most common form of eyes and are presumably the ancestral form of compound eyes. They are found in all arthropod groups, although they may have evolved more than once within this phylum. Some anlids and bivalves also have apposition eyes. They are also possessed by limulus, the horseshoe crab and there are suggestions that other chalicerates developed their simple eyes, by reduction from a compound starting point. Some caterpillars appear to have evolved compound eyes from simple eyes in the opposite fashion. Apposition eyes work by gathering a number of images, one from each eye, and combining them in the brain, with each eye typically contributing a single point of information. The typical apposition eye has a lens focusing light from one direction on the rhabdom, while light from other directions is absorbed by the dark wall of the ometidium. The second type is named the superposition eye. The superposition eye is divided into three types, refracting, reflecting, and parabolic superposition. The refracting superposition eye has a gap between the lens and the rhabdom, 
and no side wall. Each lens takes light at an angle to its axis and reflects it to the same angle on the other side. The result is an image at half the radius of the eye, which is where the tips of the rhabdoms are. This type of compound eye, for which a minimal size exists below which effective superposition cannot occur, is normally found in nocturnal insects, because it can create images up to 1,000 times brighter than equivalent apposition eyes, though at the cost of reduced resolution. In the parabolic superposition compound eye type, seen in arthropods such as mayflies, the parabolic surfaces of the inside of each facet focus light from a reflector to a sensor array. Long-bodied decapod crustaceans such as shrimp, prawns, crayfish, and lobsters are alone in having reflecting superposition eyes, which also have a transparent gap but use corner mirrors instead of lenses. This eye type functions by refracting light, then using a parabolic mirror to focus the image, it combines features of superposition and apposition eyes. Another kind of compound eye, found in males of order Strepsiptera, employs a series of simple eyes eyes having one opening that provides light for an entire image forming retina. Several of these eyelids together form the Strepsipteran compound eye, which is similar to the schizocroal compound eyes of some trilobites. Because each eyelid is a simple eye, it produces an inverted image, those images are combined in the brain to form one unified image. Because the aperture of an eyelid is larger than the facets of a compound eye, this arrangement allows vision under low light levels. Good flyers such as flies or honeybees, or prey-catching insects such as praying mantis or dragonflies, have specialized zones of omatidia organized into a fovea area which gives acute vision. In the acute zone, the eyes are flattened and the facets larger. The flattening allows more omatidia to receive light from a spot and therefore higher resolution. The black spot that can be seen on the compound eyes of such insects, which always seems to look directly at the observer, is called a pseudopupil. This occurs because the omatidia which one observes head-on, along their optical axes, absorb the incident light, while those to one side reflect it. There are some exceptions from the types mentioned above. Some insects have a so-called single-lens compound eye, a transitional type which is something between a superposition type of the multi-lens compound eye and the single-lens eye found in animals with simple eyes. Then there is the mycid shrimp, Dioptromesis possispinosa. The shrimp has an eye of the refracting superposition type. In the rear behind this in each eye there is a single large facet that is three times in diameter the others in the eye and behind this is an enlarged crystalline cone. This projects an upright image on a specialized retina. The resulting eye is a mixture of a simple eye within a compound eye. Another version is a compound eye often referred to as pseudo-faceted, as seen in Scutigera. This type of eye consists of a cluster of numerous omatidia on each side of the head, organized in a way that resembles a true compound eye. The body of Ophiocoma wentii, a type of brittle star, is covered with omatidia, turning its whole skin into a compound eye. The same is true of many chitons. The tube feet of sea urchins contain photoreceptor proteins, which together act as a compound eye. They lack screening pigments, but can detect the directionality of light by the shadow cast by its opaque body. The ciliary body is triangular in horizontal section and is coated by a double layer, the ciliary epithelium. The inner layer is transparent and covers the vitreous body, and is continuous from the neural tissue of the retina. The outer layer is highly pigmented, continuous with the retinal pigment epithelium, and constitutes the cells of the dilator muscle. The vitreous is the transparent, colorless, gelatinous mass that fills the space between the lens of the eye and the retina lining the back of the eye. It is produced by certain retinal cells. It is of rather similar composition to the cornea, but contains very few cells, mostly phagocytes which remove unwanted cellular debris in the visual field, as well as the hyalocytes of bolish of the surface of the vitreous, which reprocess the hyaluronic acid, no blood vessels, and 98-99% of its volume is water, as opposed to 75% in the cornea, with salts, sugars, vitrocin, a type of collagen, a network of collagen type 2 fibers with the mucopolysaccharide hyaluronic acid, and also a wide array of proteins in micro amounts. Amazingly, with so little solid matter, it totally holds the eye. Photoreception is phylogenetically very old, with various theories of phylogenesis. The common origin. Monophily, of all animal eyes is now widely accepted as fact. This is based upon the shared genetic features of all eyes, that is, all modern eyes, varied as they are, 
have their origins in a proto I believe to have evolved some 650 to 600 million years ago, and the Pax 6 gene is considered a key factor in this. The majority of the advancements in early eyes are believed to have taken only a few million years to develop, since the first predator to gain true imaging would have touched off an arms race among all species that did not flee the photopic environment. Prey animals and competing predators alike would be at a distinct disadvantage without such capabilities and would be less likely to survive and reproduce. Hence multiple eye types and subtypes developed in parallel, except those of groups, such as the vertebrates, that were only forced into the photopic environment at a late stage. Eyes in various animals show adaptation to their requirements. For example, the eye of a bird of prey has much greater visual acuity than a human eye, and in some cases can detect ultraviolet radiation. The different forms of eye in, for example, vertebrates and mollusks are examples of parallel evolution, despite their distant common ancestry. Phenotypic convergence of the geometry of cephalopod and most vertebrate eyes creates the impression that the vertebrate eye evolved from an imaging cephalopod eye, but this is not the case, as the reversed roles of their respective ciliary and rhabdomeric opsin classes and different lens crystal lens show. The very earliest eyes, called eye spots, were simple patches of photoreceptor protein in unicellular animals. In multicellular beings, multicellular eye spots evolved physically similar to the receptor patches for taste and smell. These eyes pots could only sense ambient brightness, they could distinguish light and dark, but not the direction of the light source. Through gradual change, the eye spots of species living in well-lit environments depressed into a shallow cup shape. The ability to slightly discriminate directional brightness was achieved by using the angle at which the light hit certain cells to identify the source. The pit deepened over time, the opening diminished in size, and the number of photoreceptor cells increased, forming an effective pinhole camera that was capable of dimly distinguishing shapes. However, the ancestors of modern hagfish, thought to be the protovertebrate, were evidently pushed to very deep, dark waters, where they were less vulnerable to sighted predators, and where it is advantageous to have a convex eye spot, which gathers more light than a flat or concave one. This would have led to a somewhat different evolutionary trajectory for the vertebrate eye than for other animal eyes. The thin overgrowth of transparent cells over the eye's aperture, originally formed to prevent damage to the eye spot, allowed the segregated contents of the eye chamber to specialize into a transparent humor that optimized color filtering, blocked harmful radiation, improved the eye's refractive index, and allowed functionality outside of water. The transparent protective cells eventually split into two layers, with circulatory fluid in between that allowed wider viewing angles and greater imaging resolution, and the thickness of the transparent layer gradually increased, in most species with the transparent crystalline protein. The gap between tissue layers naturally formed a biconvex shape, an optimally ideal structure for a normal refractive index. Independently, a transparent layer and a non-transparent layer split forward from the lens, the cornea and iris. Separation of the forward layer again formed a humor, the aqueous humor. This increased refractive power and again eased circulatory problems. Formation of a non-transparent ring allowed more blood vessels, more circulation, and larger eye sizes. Eyes are generally adapted to the environment and life requirements of the organism which bears them. For instance, the distribution of photoreceptors tends to match the area in which the highest acuity is required with horizon-scanning organisms, such as those that live on the African plains, having a horizontal line of high-density ganglia, while tree-dwelling creatures which require good all-round vision tend to have a symmetrical distribution of ganglia, with acuity decreasing outwards from the center. Of course, for most eye types, it is impossible to diverge from a spherical form, so only the density of optical receptors can be altered. In organisms with compound eyes, it is the number of omatidia rather than ganglia that reflects the region of highest data acquisition. Optical superposition eyes are constrained to a spherical shape, but other forms of compound eyes may deform to a shape where more omatidia are aligned to, say, the horizon, without altering the size or density of individual omatidia. Eyes of horizon scanning organisms have stalks so they can be easily aligned to the horizon when this is inclined, for example, if the animal is on a slope. An extension of this concept is that the eyes of predators typically have a zone of very acute vision at their center, to assist in the identification of prey. 
In deep water organisms, it may not be the center of the eye that is enlarged. The hyperiod amphipods are deep water animals that feed on organisms above them. Their eyes are almost divided into two, with the upper region thought to be involved in detecting the silhouettes of potential prey or predators against the faint light of the sky above. Accordingly, deeper water hyperiods, where the light against which the silhouettes must be compared is dimmer, have larger upper eyes, and may lose the lower portion of their eyes altogether. In the giant Antarctic isopod Glyptonotus a small ventral compound eye is physically completely separated from the much larger dorsal compound eye. Depth perception can be enhanced by having eyes which are enlarged in one direction. Distorting the eye slightly allows the distance to the object to be estimated with a high degree of accuracy. Acuity is higher among male organisms that mate in midair, as they need to be able to spot and assess potential mates against a very large backdrop. On the other hand, the eyes of organisms which operate in low light levels, such as around dawn and dusk or in deep water, tend to be larger. To increase the amount of light that can be captured, it is not only the shape of the eye that may be affected by lifestyle. Eyes can be the most visible parts of organisms, and this can act as a pressure on organisms to have more transparent eyes at the cost of function. Eyes may be mounted on stalks to provide better all round vision, by lifting them above an organism's carapace. This also allows them to track predators or prey without moving the head. Visual acuity, or resolving power, is the ability to distinguish fine detail and is the property of cone cells. It is often measured in cycles per degree, CPD, which measures an angular resolution, or how much an eye can differentiate one object from another in terms of visual angles. Resolution in CPD can be measured by bar charts of different numbers of white slash black stripe cycles. For example, if each pattern is 1.75 cm wide and is placed at 1 m distance from the eye, it will subtend an angle of 1 degree, so the number of white slash black bar pairs on the pattern will be a measure of the cycles per degree of that pattern. The highest such number that the eye can resolve as stripes, or distinguish from a gray block, is then the measurement of visual acuity of the eye. For a human eye with excellent acuity, the maximum theoretical resolution is 50 CPD. 1.2 arc minute per line pair, or a 0.35 mm line pair, at 1 m. A rat can resolve only about 1 to 2 CPD. A horse has higher acuity through most of the visual field of its eyes than a human has, but does not match the high acuity of the human eye's central fovea region. Spherical aberration limits the resolution of a 7 mm pupil to about 3 arc minutes per line pair. At a pupil diameter of 3 mm, the spherical aberration is greatly reduced resulting in an improved resolution of approximately 1.7 arc minutes per line pair. A resolution of 2 arc minutes per line pair, equivalent to a 1 arc minute gap in an optotype, corresponds to 20 20ths normal vision in humans. However, in the compound eye, the resolution is related to the size of individual omatidia and the distance between neighboring omatidia. Physically these cannot be reduced in size to achieve the acuity seen with single lensed eyes as in mammals. Compound eyes have a much lower acuity than vertebrate eyes. Color vision is the faculty of the organism to distinguish lights of different spectral qualities. All organisms are restricted to a small range of electromagnetic spectrum. This varies from creature to creature, but is mainly between wavelengths of 400 and 700 nanometers. This is a rather small section of the electromagnetic spectrum, probably reflecting the submarine evolution of the organ. Water blocks out all but two small windows of the M spectrum, and there has been no evolutionary pressure among land animals to broaden this range. The most sensitive pigment, rhodopsin, has a peak response at 500 nanometers. Small changes to the genes coding for this protein can tweak the peak response by a few nm. Pigments in the lens can also filter incoming light, changing the peak response. Many organisms are unable to discriminate between colors, seeing instead in shades of gray, color vision. Necessitates a range of pigment cells which are primarily sensitive to smaller ranges of the spectrum. In primates, geckos, and other organisms, these take the form of cone cells, from which the more sensitive rod cells evolved. Even if organisms are physically capable of discriminating different colors, this does not necessarily mean that they can perceive the different colors, only with behavioral tests can this be deduced. Most organisms with color vision can detect ultraviolet light. This high-energy light can be damaging to receptor cells. With a few exceptions, snakes, placental mammals, 
most organisms avoid these effects by having absorbent oil droplets around their cone cells. The alternative, developed by organisms that had lost these oil droplets in the course of evolution, is to make the lens impervious to UV light. This precludes the possibility of any UV light being detected, as it does not even reach the retina. The retina contains two major types of light-sensitive photoreceptor cells used for vision, the rods and the cones. Rods cannot distinguish colors, but are responsible for low-light, scotopic, monochrome, black and white, vision. They work well in dim light as they contain a pigment, rhodopsin, visual purple, which is sensitive at low-light intensity, but saturates at higher, photopic, intensities. Rods are distributed throughout the retina but there are none at the fovea and none at the blind spot. Rod density is greater in the peripheral retina than in the central retina. Cones are responsible for color vision. They require brighter light to function than rods require. In humans, there are three types of cones, maximally sensitive to long wavelength, medium wavelength, and short wavelength light, often referred to as red, green, and blue, respectively, though the sensitivity peaks are not actually at these colors. The color seen is the combined effect of stimuli to, and responses from, these three, types of cone cells. Cones are mostly concentrated in and near the fovea. Only a few are present at the sides of the retina. Objects are seen most sharply in focus when their images fall on the fovea, as when one looks at an object directly. Cone cells and rods are connected through intermediate cells in the retina to nerve fibers of the optic nerve. When rods and cones are stimulated by light, they connect through adjoining cells within the retina to send an electrical signal to the optic nerve fibers. The optic nerves send off impulses through these fibers to the brain. The pigment molecules used in the eye are various, but can be used to define the evolutionary distance between different groups, and can also be an aid in determining which are closely related although problems of convergence do exist. Opsins are the pigments involved in photoreception. Other pigments, such as melanin, are used to shield the photoreceptor cells from light leaking in from the sides. The opsin protein group evolved long before the last common ancestor of animals, and has continued to diversify since. There are two types of opsin involved in vision, C-opsins, which are associated with ciliary type photoreceptor cells, and R-opsins, associated with rhabdomeric photoreceptor cells. The eyes of vertebrates usually contain ciliary cells with C-opsins, and, bilaterion, invertebrates have rhabdomeric cells in the eye with R-opsins. However, some ganglion cells of vertebrates express R-opsins, suggesting that their ancestors used this pigment in vision, and that remnants survive in the eyes. Likewise, C-opsins have been found to be expressed in the brain of some invertebrates. They may have been expressed in ciliary cells of larval eyes, which were subsequently resorbed into the brain on metamorphosis to the adult form. C-opsins are also found in some derived bilateral in invertebrate eyes, such as the pallial eyes of the bivalve mollusks, however, the lateral eyes, which were presumably the ancestral type for this group, if eyes evolved once there, always use R-opsins. Nadaria, which are an outgroup to the taxa mentioned above, express C-opsins but R-opsins are yet to be found in this group. Incidentally, the melanin produced in the nadaria is produced in the same fashion as that in vertebrates, suggesting the common descent of this pigment, as that in vertebrates, 